He made headlines when he marched with George Floyd protesters. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo. It feels like we have not just one or two bad apples in our police forces, but a lot of bad apples. Here's the truth of the matter. We have bushels of apples. He won national praise, but faced some local anger. How do your fellow chiefs hear that? Because not everyone was marching with Black Lives Matter protesters. Is police reform the answer? You hear people talk about defund the police. Lord, that's a loaded question. A real, raw, and revealing conversation. How worried are you about whether white supremacists have infiltrated police departments? Hey, Chief, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, you and I always have a good time together, and it's uh, even in these crazy times, it's good to have you on the show. Hey, it's always uh, good to be on with a great friend and someone that uh, really uh, is making a difference out here in, uh, across the nation. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I need to get you out to California. I, I have a feeling you and California would go well together again. I lived in L.A. I grew up in L.A. right outside of Los Angeles, and my first 21 years was with the California Heart Patrol. It was Chips, John and Ponch. I love that. Oh, I love that. My name is Art Acevedo. I'm the police chief in Houston, Texas. They want people of color to be talked about as being thugs and we're bums. And, and, and my people, for, as an immigrant, we're rapists. Hmm. We, we know what? We built this country. Yeah. 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 We got for them. Yeah. We ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Let, let me just say this to the president of the United States on behalf of the police chiefs in this country. Please, if you don't have something constructive to say, keep your mouth shut. The nation has uh, united against uh, police uh, misconduct. And I really believe we're at a watershed moment and, I, and we're very hopeful that we're gonna see some, uh, some real change, systemic change in our country. You're not a Republican, you're not a Democrat, you're not a conservative, you're not a liberal, you're not a progressive, you are an American and American blood is being shed every day in this community. Chief, let's dive into some of the issues that people are talking about in the country about police right now. I had a conversation recently with someone, and as much as I don't want to say this, it feels like we have not just one or two bad apples in our police forces, but we've got enough of a problem that if you were in any other industry, you would say, guys, we have a major problem. Doesn't mean that everyone's bad, but it also means it's not just one or two. Like, there's no way to look at this and not say that there isn't kind of a systemic set of issues. You agree with that? You disagree with that? Here's the truth of the matter. I think we have to provide context to what's going on with policing. Number one, let's let's realize the how big policing is. It's 800,000 police officers representing about 18,000 police departments. I used to always say the few bad apples. If, if we've had a run out in our department, uh, up close to 170 people now in four years, how can we say that's a few bad apples? It's bushels of apples. So having said that, we have to acknowledge that we do have some issues, that we do have problems, but we also have to put things into context in that uh, we have bushels of bad apples, but then we have uh, fields upon fields of good apples. And the problem with policing truly is the chiefs. I, I always say it's a leadership problem. The community knows bad policing when they see it. And I think what happens is no one likes to see people fail. And you've heard this term that the use of deadly force was lawful but awful. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. But when it's lawful but awful, why aren't we holding people accountable for awful, right? It should be lawful but necessary. Lawful but could not have been avoided, not lawful, but awful. And I think that too many chiefs tolerate lawful, but awful, instead of demanding lawful, but necessary as it relates to use of deadly force. Arguably, this profession is probably the most scrutinized in this country. I'd like to say that as bad as things can be and as much work as we need to do, in a lot of ways, police are well ahead of corporate America and the rest of America as it relates to inclusion, uh, opportunities uh, as it relates to diversity. You know, look who's the chief here in, in Houston and the president of the major city chiefs. Compare our diversity and the opportunities that people of color have and women with policing to corporate America. Chief, I appreciate a lot of what you shared there and, and I think it is right and thoughtful and powerful. A couple of questions as I hear that. 
One, how do your fellow chiefs hear that? In other words, are you Serpico? Are, are, you, are you the guy who's coming in and saying out loud what some other people believe, but what other people are like, hey dude, keep your mouth shut because not everyone was marching with Black Lives Matters protesters. Not everyone was kneeling with people. Not everyone is saying bushels. A lot of people are still saying few bad apples. What are they saying to you? Well, I, I think that, uh, first of all, they elected me to be their, their, their president for the 69 largest police departments in the country and Canada. And by and large, the chiefs agree. But out of the 69 American police chiefs in big cities, 18 will be gone by the end of the year, including some very progressive chiefs. And the problem is because it's such a politicized uh, position in terms of mayors that immediately when something goes wrong, they got a scapegoat of folks. And I always tell young assistant police chiefs across the country that I mentor, if you're, if you're afraid to lose your job, don't take it in the first place. Because uh, the most replaceable person in, in the police department is the police chief. And quite frankly, if you're paralyzed by the fear of losing your job, you won't be able to do it. The community is watching us and they're all going to hold us accountable, not just for what we say, not just for what we do, but for what we fail to say and do. Right now, what's happening in our country is we have a man, a son, a brother, an uncle, a cousin of Estonian, a child of God that was killed by servants, supposed to be servants of God, they showed no mercy. When George Floyd was murdered, I promise you on my social media and in this community, they're looking to see what does my police chief think about that? And so it's a huge mistake for leaders to think, regardless of the political uh, reality they, they, they're operating in, it's a huge mistake for them to think that people aren't watching and our willingness to speak or, not, or, or, or say or not say stuff will impact our standing in that community. You've testified both before judiciary committees in Congress that defunding the police is not the answer to solving the social and economic problems in this country. Why do you believe cutting funding is the wrong move? It's kind of like if you're going to build a new sports stadium, you, you don't you don't tear down the old sports stadium uh, and stop using it until the new one's new. So we have to be very thoughtful because I know in my community, I don't think that they don't want less police, they want better policing, and they want the same opportunities uh, other communities have. Chief, talk about some of the changes you think would make a difference. I mean, you hear people talk about defund the police, you hear people talk about abolition of the police. What would have made the biggest difference in the lives, not only of Breonna Taylor and of George Floyd, but of a whole suite of other people um, who are counting on the police. What top three things would you want to see done? I think first and foremost, to think that in the year 2020, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, you were still allowed to put your knee on the neck of a suspect, you know, uh, of a, pit, a person you're taking into custody and, and put your knee on them. We have to come up for some standardized, policies to take away the, the the authorization of police officers outside of a fight for your life. Outside of that, you need to leave the neck alone. That's not, that's too dangerous. So we've got to have some standardized policies. We need to really have a, uh, a national database tracking what police officers are dismissed or leave service under duress uh, or in lieu of being fired. I'm a realist. Getting rid of qualified immunity across the country is probably not going to happen, but I think that we have to address it and go back to a standard that uh, that is a little bit more meanable, to give people the ability to hold uh, bad cops accountable. How worried are you about whether white supremacists have infiltrated police departments in meaningful enough numbers that that's also part of the issue, that you don't just have bad apples or bushels of apples, but you have determined people who have focused agendas who are joining with with a a purpose? I think we need to uh, do everything we can to, to weed out hate and hatred in society. Period. Criminal elements and people that uh, are racist or white supremacist will try to infiltrate police department. It is a challenge, and it's something we have to be uh, vigilant and uh, on the lookout for. Chief, how worried are you about the fact that, that in lots of groups, not just police, there's this sense of snitches get stitches, right? That, that you don't want people to tell on each other, that even if people 
are concerned, worried, disappointed, frustrated that someone's breaking the rules. The notion is us before them. And is that also a meaningful enough issue that if you really are going to have broad, meaningful change, that it's not just a national database, it's not just changing the policies on you know use of force around necks, it's not just uh, X, Y, and Z, but that it also uh, is a larger changing, if you will, of the heart and, and soul. Here's what we have to do. We have to understand that you have a duty to report, you've got to have a solid policy, and you have to have consequences, significant consequences for people that don't report misconduct. But it's not just what you said, it's what you enforce. You have to enforce it, you have to make your expectations clear, and you have to be consistent in the application of that policy. Chief, so tell me a little bit about how you grew up. Um, born in Cuba, right? Yep, yep, born in Cuba. Uh, at, at four and a half on 12-12 of 68, we uh, we received uh, political asylum and uh, we were able to come here as uh, Cuban refugees. And uh, my dad used to tell us, I'm the baby of four, and my dad used to tell us, hey kids, from here from, from here to the moon, there's no better place on earth than the United States of America. And, and, then, and then raised us to understand that the United States had given us the greatest gift of all, which is freedom, man, I mean, you know, the freedom to pursue your dreams, the freedom to say what you what you want to say. And uh, and he always used to say, don't forget that the the worst day with the freedom the United States gives us is better than the best day under communist rule. I grew up in Miami. And so, you know, we had a large Cuban American population there, but I didn't hear about a lot of Cubanos going out to LA. How did you guys uh, break away from the fold and head out west? You know what? My dad didn't want us to be around a bunch of Cubanos, even though we we, we very much love our culture and we've never backed away from it. So he said, we're going to go to L.A. I really believe had we stayed in Miami or gone in New Jersey to one of the pockets of uh, Cuban population, I, I, I don't believe I'd be here today. The police chief in the largest city in Texas and the fourth largest city in the United States, soon to be third largest city. So I thought it was uh, very forward thinking. Interesting, say more. Why do you think you ended up as a different person in LA? Because, you know, we were, if we were stayed in Miami, we probably would have, uh, you know, people sometimes tend to, uh, they, they tend to gravitate towards their own, right? And so uh, I think that it, it forced me to learn about other cultures and other kids. And, and by the end of the first year, it forced me to be bilingual. And I think that's what prepared me to serve here in Houston, which is the most diverse big city in the country. So, so what were you like as a high school kid? Were you, were you loud? Were you quiet? Like, like, who were you? I think it's safe to say that I was a little loud. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I have a sense of humor that sometimes would get you in trouble. I just wasn't that crazy about high school. I mean, I just felt like, oh, Lord, you know, it's like it's boring. I used to read Newsweek, Time Magazine, uh, U.S. News and World Report, all the different weeklies. Half the time in class, I'd be reading those those magazines because I was more interested in world events and current events than in the, you know, uh, math or writing, uh, you know, writing uh, an essay. And so did you head right into law enforcement after high school or how did you make your way into uh, the California Highway Patrol? My dad was a cop before the communists in Cuba and he used to tell, you know, really funny stories about policing. You, remember, there's a third world policing, so... There was the Constitution was it? I mean, you, I, I had explained to him once I became a cop that that's not the way we do things in this country, right? And so uh, <laughs> we became. Uh, so I like to hear those stories. Then I either wanted to be that I wanted to go to West Point and be a commissioned officer, uh, or I wanted to be a prosecutor. Went to law school for a semester and a half, and halfway through my second semester, uh, you know, I asked. I asked myself, they had 150,000 lawyers in California, I said, do, do they really need another one? And the answer was no. And as luck would have it, we had a, a police chief that had just, re that was getting ready to retire that was going through law school. And he looked at me and he says, Art, you can always go back to law school, but you keep talking about how you want to be a police officer. So I went and uh, be joined the California Highway Patrol, uh, and I've never looked back. So what is it about being a cop that you enjoyed so much? Because you can really make a difference. I mean, it sounds canned, it sounds corny, but if you do the job like most police officers do, you touch lives and you touch lives for the right reason. I was one of those corny guys that what I would arrest 
people in East LA and I'd talk to them about things and they and 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 some of the guys that were gang members, they'd get angry. Why are you being so nice, Holmes? I said, because <laughs> this isn't personal, man, and you're a person. And you know, and there's more to life than getting yourself arrested for whatever uh, they happen to be arrested for. And so I just really believe that as a, the profession of being a, law, a professional peace officer, um, you really have an impact on society. I remember as an officer, some guy comes up to me and says, hey, uh, this guy was actually a drunk driver. And he says, hey, I want to, a drunk driver that fought me, by the way, he was really uh, put up a good fight. And, uh, and he comes up, I barely recognize that. He says, hey, I want to, uh, I'm so-and-so, I'm the guy you arrested. Well, hey, sir, how are you? He goes, I want to thank you because you changed my life. Tell me a little bit about when you've been scared. Do you ever find yourself scared? The only time that I really think that in my career that I can think back where I was truly scared was during the Los Angeles riots after the Rodney King incident, um, where you know about 55 Americans lost their lives during the riots. I think I found myself scared, concerned, because you just, you know, everything was on fire. You didn't know what was going on. There wasn't good intelligence. There wasn't good briefings. I've looked at, I've grown since then to realize that uh, this is a dangerous profession, but I also believe in destiny. And no matter what you do for a living, when it's your time, it's your time. Chief, how did you end up becoming a chief? You know, the CHP, when I got on, we used to joke uh, that I thought the C was for for C Cuban Highway Patrol or Chicano Highway Patrol, but uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but there was hardly nobody of color in leadership positions. So we started to say this is the Caucasian Highway Patrol, right? And so, you know, there were like close to 100 captains at the time, like one was a Hispanic. Think about that in California. Uh, we had one Hispanic chief, one black chief, that was it. And so I realized that sometimes when you're an immigrant or you're a person of color or you come from a lower socioeconomic uh, circumstances, we're too happy just getting our foot in the door. But you see, we have to position ourselves to be change agents and I felt that I wanted to increase my, my sphere of influence. What do you think about now as a chief that back when you were a on foot patrol or what have you, never even occurred to you. When you're an officer, a lot of times what you see is right in front of you. You're very you're very focused. What's in front of you, you come to work, you, you handle your calls, you make you take your reports, you write your arrests, and you go home. A police chief has to look about impacts. What are the impacts of uh, our actions? What are the impacts of our decisions? Because the decisions that you make uh, at, at, a, uh, at, at an executive level in law enforcement and as a peace officer, you have to weigh impacts at all times. As I hear you talk about things, you sound a little bit like a management guru. At the end of the day, we're coaches, right? When you're leading people, it's about coaching people. I'm out in the streets with my officers, out in the community. with the co You can't build relationships from behind a desk. I'm out in the field of the community. Chief, what do you say to people who say, Smart guy, good guy, but he's a showboat. He's spending too much time in the media. He's not doing his job, and he's showing the rest of us up. What do you say to those folks? You know what? What I'm promoting is my department, my profession, and ultimately the relationship between this community or the communities that we serve and the men and women that we lead. And so uh, I said guilty as charged, and guess what? It works. Hey, uh, Chief, I'm gonna finish up with what I call my rapid fire. I'm gonna give you things. I want your immediate reaction to them. Okay, um, got it. Your favorite movie of all time, or one of your favorite movies. Scarface. Say hello to my little friend. Are you Democrat or Republican? I'm a rhino dino, which means that I'm too far to the left for the right, too far to the right for the left. Something's happening with your city of Houston. I feel like Houston's the one to watch when it comes to big cities. It's the city of tomorrow, man. We're a reflection of what America is gonna look like in the next 20 years. We're the most diverse city. Then we set a beautiful example for the rest of the country and the world. It's a great place. Hey, Chief, what do you think when I say blue lives matter? They do, but the problem with blue lives matter, what happened with that and all lives matter, is that when Black Lives Matter, that came up, the answer was simply to say and acknowledge 
Black lives do matter. What a real pleasure. I appreciate you uh, being on, and uh, you know this won't be the last time. No, brother, come and see us, man. Rodeo, don't forget, rodeo on the other side of COVID. Oh, man, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, Carlos. Love you, my brother. It's good to see you. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with my friend Art Acevedo. He's a super interesting guy. I think he's probably one of the most intriguing leaders in the country, not just police leaders. I love his thoughts on leadership and management. I love that kind of certainty that he kind of proceeds about in the world. He reminds me of so many people I've gotten to know over the years from a chef and a host like Padma Lakshmi to the late Senator John McCain. May he rest in peace. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Hope you learned a little bit, some big thoughts on policing policy going forward. Let's see whether or not he's the person that lots of folks turn to next year and beyond. Hey, if you're enjoying this, I hope you'll subscribe. I hope you'll tell a friend. And if you're really special, I hope you'll listen to the podcast. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into the Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.